Okay, so it's recording now. Good. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to show you that, which was um, um, the thing I prepared. Oh, it's not here. It should be here. Okay. And actually, I'm going to show it to you to um, my account. Um, and once you see it in there, we can just go and fast forward. Okay. Uh, I don't want to um, spend too much time on this one. So that will be the last one. I think, no, it's the second to last. Okay, that's the one. Uh, religious opposition to the Nazis. <laughs> of course, um, I hope you understood that because you are smart people. What we've done, um, what was our last thing we've done in the class? It was that one with, why was Hitler able to dominate Germany by 1934? How would you, um, any one of, uh, of you, you can, you can, let's discuss, okay? How would you remodel this question? This was actually, um, another question underneath this title. So can you, can you think of some question? How would you remodel this in a question talking about significance or importance? Hmm? What do you think? Remember we were talking about Hindenburg. How, um, I will help you. So I will remodel it like this. How significant or how important was Hindenburg in Hitler's uh, ability to dominate Germany, isn't it? Actually, that was the question um, disguised under this, okay? So it was a legitimate question, but back in time, they used to actually put this kind of um, strange uh, title. So let's go back to this one, religious opposition, uh, religious opposition to Nazi rule. Um, and look at that, you have to draw a chart with uh, yes and no, how important or how significant was religious opposition to the Nazi rule. And look at that, um, Catholic Church spoke out against Nazis. Uh, remember that they spoke out um, against um, Nazis. And because of that speaking out, they actually stopped the euthanasia program after they just started. So they managed to kill some uh, people, but they stopped the program in 1941. Remember, we talk about that extensively. Um, then you have the Cardinal Gallen, um, who was opposing Nazis um, in his um, kind of, um, you know, during the religious service. Um, Nazis did not take action uh, against him to stop him become a martyr because he, he, they didn't want to kill the guy or send him to the concentration camp. Um, they were like, ah, oh, whatever, let him speak. Uh, it's not going to make too much damage. It's not going to be such a big deal. Um, and then you have the case of Joseph Frings, uh, who was a rural Catholic priest. And um, um, he started um, kind of like um, a competition for um, Hitler Youth, Hitler Youth. And his competition was kind of called the Catholic Youth Organization. So he started to um, lure people, young people, towards uh, Catholic uh, organization rather than Nazis. Uh, I will always go towards a religious organization, no matter religion, uh, rather than Nazis, because uh, Nazis were really, uh, uh, how should I put this, really bad. The, the problem with Nazis, when we, do, you know, we all talk about Nazis, Nazis are non-stop, everything is about Nazis in this uh, depth study, and uh, they are obviously the bad guys. The problem with these people, the huge problem is that heaps of people in Germany were on that wave, you know, they just, they were really on that wave, traveling with the wave. Uh, endorsing some of the policies that it's a combination, a very unfortunate mixture of heaps of uh, 
uh, problems all over the world. It's a kind of the world. The world was uh, the world was really like we have the world our day, nowadays with heaps of problems. I, w- I wouldn't be surprised if we'll have uh, another world war in 10 years from now. That there won't be any surprise because everything is brewing around and everyone is unhappy with something. All the countries are fighting against each other. They they are rearming. Look at China, look at Americans. So th- there won't be any surprise. God help us. We don't want that, but there won't be any surprise for a world war to, ha- to start again. Anyway, back to this. Um, Protestant opposition, Martin Niemöller, and the guy who spoke out against the German Christian Church, you know that Nazis wanted to actually create this um, counterpart to the uh, traditional Catholic uh, stuff. So he wanted to create his own uh, church, Hitler, uh, call it um, German Christian Church. And so uh, they formed an alternative confessional church. Paul Schneider criticized by uh, Nazis, especially Goebbels. Jehovah's Witnesses opposed Nazi policies, and because of that, they've been persecuted a lot. They were actually a subject in the persecution list. So we talk about um, you talk about uh, Jews, you talk about communists, homosexuals, uh, Roma, gypsies, and you have another thing in there: Jehovah's Witnesses. So um, kind of. Um, a persecuted part of society. And then for the no, um, uh, remember the question um, will be uh, roughly um, if there was any efficient religious opposition uh, to Nazi rule uh, in this period, 1935-1945. Remember, boys, you always have to stick to the to this period. So you'll say how significant was the religious opposition in this period, or uh, how important do you think it was important or not? And you have to stick to um, this period, 1934-1945. Anyway, uh, for no church leaders sent to concentration camps, so they, um, the Nazis were really, uh, they didn't care too much. Neymar uh, and Schneider were sent there. New Nazi Reichschurch and German faith movement set up at alternatives, informal cell police track down enemies of the state and the churches. So they've been everywhere, um, you know, kind of like sitting around churches and looking at um, uh, people who's coming in, who's going out, uh, sometimes uh, stopping people and questioning. Um, and all sorts of other things. You have to talk about the bomb plot. Uh, Ms. Begovich talked about that. It was in July 1944. <coughs> and then youth groups. Swing movement, otherwise pirates and white roses. Uh, it was not only the church who um, did that uh, opposition. So then, what you write in here? Yes, significant. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Joseph Frings, Jacobus Ministers. No, not so significant. Uh, the opposition because of the Concordat, which was uh, um, again Concordat was that pact between the church, the Catholic Church, and uh, the Nazis. Um, the Probably one of the biggest shame on the church um, part side, okay. And then the bomb plot, uh, which uh, was, um, um, you know, in another uh, direction, another story, and also the youth movements and the swing movement. So, um, how significant was um, um, the religious movement? Significant because of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Jehovah's Witnesses and other people, and no, so not so significant because of the um, church, Catholic Church, who actually um, shook hand with Hitler, uh, because of the bomb plot, which was different, and because of the youth movements, which again were different. Uh, maybe this part was more significant than the role of the church. Okay, and um, <clears throat> the next thing, uh, introduction, little religious opposition. Look at that. There was little coordinated religious opposition to Nazi rule from 34 to 35, as Hitler instated uh, the totalitarian regime control over Germany. That was clear uh, from the beginning. In this case, it's enough for you to write one sentence. Okay, keep introduction introduction brief. Why only one sentence in this case? Um, you can always make it in two if you want, but it's lo- it's a long. 
um, it's not even a sentence, it's a phrase, okay? And so it's because religious opposition was not so important. If you talk, for example, youth uh, opposition to the Nazis, then you have to write more because youth opposition was really important. Religious opposition was very small, but pay some attention, boys, they always come after you with small, small uh, details, with small bits and pieces. We're going to go now after we finish this fast forward, we're going to go and look into some past papers and I'll show you um, some very, very small pieces of information that you will never think uh, that's possible. OK, so next. Um, <clears throat> paragraph one. Uh, in here, you have to write five to six sentences. Again, analyze, don't just um, retell the story. Uh, we talk about Dietrich uh, Bonhoeffer and what he did and Bonhoeffer execution. So few religious figures make life difficult for the Nazis. Remember, always back to the question, okay? Religious opposition was uh, important for the Nazis, significant for the Nazis or not? That's the actual question, okay? So you're gonna see that question in there. Um, in the early uh, years of Hitler's rule, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a well-known uh, theologian, which is, uh, you know, a guy, a smart guy, uh, I don't know, a PhD in, um, in uh, theology, uh, who spoke out against Nazi rule and ideology consistently. So he was always against the Nazis, always speaking against these people. Uh, because of his stature in society, so now you put a little bit of information about this guy. That's what you need to do. Uh, you know, I didn't tell you when we've done this, but um, I missed this point, this opportunity. But actually, when you start writing, you start writing the introduction and then you write a little bit, but you don't throw your big guns immediately. You don't start writing with heaps of data and heaps of stuff, very important things. So you take it progressively, OK? So you go and write a little bit of introduction and then you talk about the first thing you want to talk, but not a very important one. Then you accelerate and you go to the to the big ones. Um, I hope you got it. So now we talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer because of his stature in society and throughout Europe. He was tolerated in Nazi Germany. He wrote theoretical papers explaining the evil of Hitler's ideology. So he started to write uh, articles uh, in the magazine and all sorts of things. And um, he criticized openly the Nazi Reich uh, Church. And this was very well received by other people opposing Hitler, obviously, throughout Europe. By 43, uh, Hitler became less worried about opinion and he was taken to a concentration camp and he was executed, um, charged with involvement in the 44 bomb plot. In the next paragraph, um, three sentences in this one, you throw your big guns, um, big starting of the big movement, a kind of a counterpounder of kind of like a counteracting the Hitler youth. There will be Joseph Rings and Catholic youth and Jehovah's Witnesses. Look at this. You start with some kind of data. Joseph Rings tried to increase membership of the Catholic youth in order to stop children from joining the Hitler youth. So already you oppose two big ideas. He did this at a great risk to himself, although with Catholics only being 33%. This is the time when he introduced data of the German population. It does not have a great effect nationwide. He was tolerated only because the Nazis did not want to make him a martyr. Don't forget about this. Um, I have a, a vague feeling that this is going to be somehow in there, something about religious uh, or religion or concordat or I don't know. Something will be in there in your exam regarding religion. Um, I hope I'm right because this is an easy one and you can write um, a little bit better than other boys being in a Catholic school. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses opposed Nazi policies, but had little impact due to their minority status and unpopularity with the Christian majority. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in Christian uh, faith are regarded as a, um, um, a sect. Okay, so just uh, 
kind of um, not very official and uh, interesting part of Christianity. So in um, in my faith, for example, in Christian Orthodox, Jehovah's Witnesses are sectants, which means they don't really propagate the word of God and stuff. So Christians, they look at them a little bit like, oh, whatever, you know. Um, of course, they have the right to um, propagate their ideas. It's their problem. Is their uh, faith. Any faith on the planet is welcome. Um, but um, they have this kind of, even in the movies, you see, uh, they make jokes about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. They say, um, um, if someone is knocking on the door non-stop and you say, go away, and they, no they knock again, and then you say, go away, that should be Jehovah's Witnesses because they are very persistent, you know, which is okay. I mean, they want to spread the word of their God. So it is what it is. So that's the reason why we have this in here. A little impact due to their minority status. Of course, just a small fraction. There's not a huge chunk of Christianity. Probably it's under 0.5% uh, or 1% maximum with the Christian majority. So Christian majority, they don't really like Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, now is the time when you throw the big guns into the... So you see how you progress with information. So you started with Bonhoeffer and talk about the first uh, moments of dissent and stuff, and then you go to um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and this thing. So now you accelerate the information. Church leaders sent to camps, a role of the Concordat, Pope's role, and um, um, another good thing, imagine non Concordat. So let, let's see. So, however, the majority of church leaders who did openly oppose um, Nazi rule. Uh, were quickly sent to concentration camps, and the Concordat ensures that uh, as an organization there was no opposition. So the church turned a um, blind eye. That was the Concordat, actually. So it was a very dirty deal in which the Catholic Church uh, said, OK, um, we're going to look in another direction when you send people in concentration camps and kill them and do euthanasia and other stuff, as long as we keep our properties intact. Uh, and again, we know that Catholic Church is the richest church on the planet. So kind of like um, a very dirty, um, you know, um, agreement. Uh, any agreement with Nazi will, Nazis will be dirty. But this uh, in particular, because from the church you expect uh, moral values. That's the first thing you expect from church. I'm not criticizing the church. I'm just saying that um, um, this was not really a good look for uh, the Catholic Church. The Pope declined to speak out against Hitler. Look at that. Uh, out uh, speaking out against uh, Hitler's anti-Semitic anti policies. The actual Pope nowadays, Pope Francis, is speaking about that. So you see the difference, it's a big difference in um, approach. Uh, even when evidence of the final solution was becoming impossible to ignore, that I will, you know, I will say that that was the worst part. When they knew what happened, they just turned a blind eye and they just looked in another direction. And it is what it is. Any organization on this planet, not only the church, any organization and other churches and other faiths, they have this kind of things, you know, like, uh, I don't know, I would say, for example, think of the um, Muslims, think of the Islam. Um, they turn a blind eye to the people who uh, were affected by the war. They started to immigrate from all parts of the world where they have Muslim societies. And the big Muslim countries, they didn't actually help them. Even one of the biggest Muslim countries, Turkey, is keeping them in a camp uh, and then releasing them uh, slowly towards Europe. So again, turning a blind eye against uh, your own people who are suffering. So it's not only in the Catholic Church. Each church will have the same problem. Uh, and not only church. Look at the governments. Governments, they don't give a toss about heaps of things happening to uh, people unless um, they win something from it. So the world we live in is not really 
um, a perfect world. Anyway, coming back to this, had the Concordat not been signed uh, and the organization of the church mobilized against the Nazis, Hitler would have had a significant rise in opposition. Look at that. This is an amazing statement. Uh, so if you use, you just imagine, you can do this in the exam, imagine, imagine if the Concordat won't be there and imagine that the church and the Pope will speak um, against um, Hitler openly and against the concentration camps and stuff. Imagine how many people will be saved because um, maybe heaps of Germans will think again uh, because um, the Catholic Church has a prestige. The Pope is the leader of uh, all Catholics on the planet and they are over one billion and so on. So um, you see how um, actually signing that pact uh, with Hitler was very beneficial for Hitler and very, very uh, non-beneficial for the Catholic Church. So um, now is the moment. So you just build up everything, all the argument until um, up to the final, OK? <coughs> and now is the moment to look at the other side of the argument and uh, look at the other significant opposition. Remember the question all the time, how significant was the uh, church uh, opposition to the Nazi regime in 34, 35, okay? So look at that, much more significant opposition came from the independent youth movements, such as the otherwise pirates and Navajos, who threatened Hitler's vision of a perfect Aryan. They wrote anti-Nazi graffiti and clashed with the Hitler Youth. They started to fight with them, you remember? Even going as far as killing members of the SS in the 1942, they killed the head of the SS, uh, which was absolutely amazing. That's the biggest, highest rank um, uh, of the Nazis killed uh, by, uh, that was the biggest, largest victory of an opposition uh, party, okay? These groups uh, posed little actual threat to the Nazis, but did threaten their indoctrination of the German youth. So they were very well known by the German youth, by the Hitler Jugend, and uh, they feared them. They were not so ineffective as we think uh, because of the low numbers. OK, so uh, they will have uh, a reputation. OK, let's put it this way. And uh, this is, again, you continue with other significant facts other than religious opposition. So you go, you are in the no area right now. And July 1944 bomb plot, um, the only major attempt to change the Nazis um, and then analyze the effectiveness of Nazi when dealing with the opposition. So July bomb plot of uh, 1944 was the biggest threat to Nazi rule but it was poorly planned and executed. And then 5,000 were imprisoned. We know the movie, we've seen that, showed that the Nazis still had complete, complete control, even at the late stage of the war. Remember July 44 was uh, when Nazis were really in disarray, uh, withdrawing from all the countries and uh, being chased and hunted. Um, this was the only major attempt of regime change, or a little bit too late in my opinion, because this, should have been done at the beginning when they realized Hitler was extremely dangerous, probably in the 40, 41 maximum, not in 44 in July. <sighs> that was a little bit uh, too late. But anyway, uh, so that's the story. The last one is conclusion. Uh, church, sorry, not church, church, insignificant opposition. Nazis were ruthless against dissent and your own final conclusion. Look at this religious, that's back to the question immediately. Religious opposition to the Nazis, while brave and courageous, was insignificant in resisting uh, Nazi rule. That should be your, um, um, your uh, conclusion. So the question was, uh, religious opposition to Nazi was significant. How significant or how important was this religious opposition to the Nazis? And you'll say, uh, ultimately insignificant. So you go back to the question and re-answer the question in uh, resisting Nazi rules. Individuals like Bonhoeffer and Fringe 
gave the Nazis a little bit of a headache, headache but they given um, uh, that they lacked, uh, lacked support of the church. They provided little in the way of actual opposition. This is not particularly surprising given that the Nazis were ruthless in crushing almost all opposition to their rule. So that's that's the story with these um, pink boys. Now, what we're going to do now, uh, can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Yes, so I have uh, Matthew, Michael, Ben. Oh, and Matthew is here, good man. Um, so I'm going to give you one minute because I need to make myself produce a coffee for myself. And then I'm going to come back with vengeance. Um, so produce a coffee for yourself or a tea and come back. OK, so. <clears throat> let's see. Uh, so I have Benjamin, Matthew, Michael and Theo. Good. Oh, let me do something cool. Request to join. <laughs> uh, I'm going to call Chris and Nathan and Riley. Good. OK, now um, let's see in here. <clears throat> um, I wanted to go uh, over um, paper one. Um, that's my big problem right now. So let's go on Cambridge IG. And uh, syllabus, no, we're not interested in specimen papers. We've done that. Uh, mark scheme. Good. This will be the one. Examination resources. Which year you want to go, boys? Come and tell me. We have these options. 2019. I think we've done something in 2019. We'll go there and see. Okay. Uh, serious, we're going to go June and November. Of course, you're going to be November. Resource type uh, will be. Um, OK, we'll go to examiner report. Marking scheme. Question paper. Great threshold. We're not interested in that. So, OK. Uh, paper one. From November, let's. Look at it. Um, good. So. Two hours paper one, obviously we do section A core content, any two questions, section B one question. OK, now. Um, section A core content. We don't look in 1848, we're not interested civil war, uh, European powers, tension in the war. Oopsie daisy, look at that. So uh, we have to do two of these. So obviously you will do this part here, uh, which is League of Nations, and this part here, which is what? This is the road to war, isn't it? Now you have to do both, you have to do two of these, and obviously Cold War, you don't look into this because this is um, not what we've studied, OK? Even if you think it's cool, and even if you think you've done something, I mean, we've done stuff about Cold War and Korea, but that's not actually where you have to do it. It's in paper two, OK? When you will have the sources. So don't look into this because that's not good, OK? So in your case, um, apart from the fact if you don't want to do, I don't know, uh, the barbed wire or something from here should be some barbed wire in here somewhere. OK, if you don't want to do that, you go with these two clear ones. OK, as Ms. Begovic said at some point, some years we have League of Nations, some years we have treaty and the League of Nations and road to war. Some years we have um, treaty and road to war without League of Nations. OK, uh, in this year uh, you had League of Nations. So look at that. The League of nations has strengths and weaknesses. Describe the dispute over the island islands. Who can tell me in two words what was that all about and who was actually in dispute? 
Sweden and Finland? Yes, Sweden and Finland. When exactly do you remember the year? Um, was it 1935? No, no, no. It was uh, early. This was one of the successes. Oh, 19, like 21? 21, yeah, exactly. Okay. 19, yeah, somewhere around 1921, Island Island. Now, um, um, it was between Sweden and Finland. They fought over the Island Island and they resolved uh, by giving um, the um, island to who won, Sweden or Finland? Finland. Remember, it, it, it's the small country who won. It's Finland, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Good. Very good. Um, excellent. So this is how you have to do it. Uh, very simple. We go back to that and I'm going to show you the marking scheme, what they say in there. Look at that. I think that's very good to work like that. What do you think, boys? Because you can see exactly, we discuss and then you can see exactly what is uh, what. Okay, let's see. So that's two three, and four. which should be here. Awesome. Look at that. So, describe the dispute over the Allen Islands. Obviously, in this case, we have to look for four valid points. My advice to you will be to find five. As always, uh, maybe one is uh, stretched or whatever, and it's not really the good one. So then you have this, uh, and that's perfect. So look at this. One mark for each relevant point. If you say the word, these islands are in the Baltic, Baltic Sea, you got a point. It's good uh, because you uh, you show um, general knowledge, so you know that these are Baltic states um, um, in that area. The dispute took place in 1921. The moment you put the year, that's another mark. So you see how easy it is. Uh, Sweden and Finland, you know that, you knew that, all of you. That's another one. Most islanders wanted to be ruled by Sweden. That's a very good information to know, to remember. So um, awesome. And then the League of Nations investigated the matter. The League ruled in the favor of Finland. Sweden accepted the judgment. The islanders were given safeguards to ensure the protection. War was avoided. The island were demilitarized. Look at that. What I'm going to do now, boys, it's a very good thing for you. Control C. What do you think I'm going to do? Look at that. What do you reckon? See what I'm doing? Your note cards. How cool is this? How easy and cool is this? Of course, you can do this by uh, checking the um, um, checking your notes and everything. But this is easier. So. Uh, basically, using the marking scheme for four, then you can go over everything. Um, what do you think about this, boys? You think it's good? Look at that. All the details you need to know are here. So I'm doing that. Here. Uh, you can still see my screen. Yep. Yeah. Good, good people. So look at that. And perfect. How cool is this? Describe the dispute over the Allen Islands. Bang, 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 bang. If you have four of any of these, bingo. That's the one. Got it? So I'm going to put this um, online, all of them in one note, and um, after we finish this, okay? So let's go to the to another one quickly. 
Um, so we were here where we, uh, we were in the in here. Uh, no, not this one here. Good. So um, good. Back to this. Why was the work of the agencies of the Na League of Nations important? What do you do in um, uh, point sixers? Remind me. To, to explain, explain answers. To explain very good, very well explained answers. Very good. So two very good explained answers. We go there and let's see. Oh, first, what are you going to say about this? Come on, give me something. What are you going to say in it's not uh, it shouldn't be perfect. We're just learning now. Come on. It's it's just uh, why was the work of the agencies important? What's the for, first and foremost? Why the work of these agencies would be important? Because there were many people suffering, isn't it? There were heaps of people as a result of uh, yeah, war and stuff like that. Prisoners of war, uh, veterans, heroes, whatever. Um, um, also, as a result of war, heaps of people were in slavery and stuff and stuff and stuff, isn't it? Let's see. Um, yeah. Why was the work of the agency of the League of Nations important? So if you go for the um, easy part, it's exactly what I started to tell you. So if you uh, want, uh, if you want to get only one point, uh, the agencies were set up to help the League of Nations. That's a very interesting statement. OK, um, and so what do you have to say? Uh, you have to go, go and create this backwards. OK, so the agencies were set up to help the League of Nations. Uh, the agencies dealt with human issues uh, for each of these, you will get one uh, credit. Look at that, the League freed slaves. You know that, simple. Um, it tackled the illegal drug trade. You know that, hopefully. Prevented the financial collapse of Austria and Hungary. We know that. Um, the International League um, um, Organization worked to improve working conditions to people. Remember the unions and all that stuff. Uh, the League saw the prisoners of war were able to return home. Remember, we talk about refugees, prisoners of war. The League dealt with refugees. If you write only these parts, you get half of the marks. Okay. Now, let's see. Um, level one, level three, explain one reason. If you explain one reason very well, you can go to four, five. Look at that. The health committee worked hard to defeat uh, leprosy and reduce the case of malaria. It was also successful in dealing with cholera, smallpox, and dysentery in the Turkish refugee camps. Heaps of facts in two sentences. Heaps of facts. Uh, another example. Nansen, head in the League's refugee organization, managed to help 425,000 displaced persons to return home or find new homes between 20s and 22. Many of these had been prisoners of war. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stranded in Soviet Russia, Poland, France, Germany, and Turkey. Tons of information in two, three sentences. His team found suitable transport, set up temporary camps, taught new trades and skills, and issued identity documents. It was a great success. Look at these boys. So easy to do this because you come up with your um, your knowledge. It's uh, common sense knowledge in here. What they are talking about, they you need to remember the name Nansen, who headed the League's refugee organization and managed to help how many people? Around 400,000, if you say that, it's okay, displayed person, to return home and then find new homes between 20 and 22. So you put the, um, the timeline and then you say, many of these has been prisoners of war. Logical. You don't have to invent this. It was there. It's there. It's coming. Stranded where? In Soviet Russia, in Poland, in France. You don't have to put all of them. Put three or four. Uh, say France, Germany, Turkey. Okay? His team found what? A way to transport these people. So it's logical. What do you do with this? How do you help them? You move them from one place to another. You set up temporary camps to be safe and secure. Yeah, you 
taught them new trade and skills to make them actually re-become functional in society and they issue an identity document and that was a great success. Look at that. And if you explain two reasons, then um, you will be on the cards. You got it? It is easy, easy. I'm telling you, it's very easy and cool. So, um, the next one, which was more important in causing the weakness of the league, its structure or the Great Depression? Explain your answer. Beautiful. So what do you do on a 10 pointers? Who's gonna remind me? Three points for two again. Good, good man. Who's that, Matthew? Yeah. Yes, good man. So three points for two against. So um, which was more important in causing the weakness of the league, the structure or the Great Depression? What will be your first inclination? What you will say the first uh, moment after you read this? So you're going to do yes and no. What you're going to put in the yes section? Give me something. Come on, boys. Weakness of the league. So weakness of the league. Um, the structure can be uh, the weakness of the league. Can be so fatal or not? What do you think? Wasn't it that the like council of the League of Nations only met every like six months? Yes, so not very efficient, not very um, prompt. Let's put it this way. So the structure can be, but uh, I don't know how much you can write about that. You can write actually a lot. Uh, what about the Great Depression? Uh, forced a lot of country like countries became far more indebted and became yeah. less willing to um, uh, ne like negotiate or be reasonable with other countries. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Let's go to thank you, Michael. Let's go to um, this to see what they say in here. <coughs> so. Um, Explanation of both sides. Let's look into level three because this is one side explanation and then they go to the next one. The structure of the league made it weak from the start. Decisions in the assembly and the council had to be taken anonymously. So in this particular aspect, you're going to look into um, the veto and the uh, unanimous decision and you're going to not debate, but say about that, say one or two sentences. So you'll say that um, the ligand was weak from the start because the way they settle everything, the way they structured the league um, was wrong because uh, there was no way to actually uh, vote uh, unanimously, um, especially in a, such a divided Europe. So you don't set something like this, for example, you go into a room and you see 40 people um, fighting with each other verbally, obviously, they, um, they are arguing and stuff, exchanging things, and then you say, oh, I have a solution for you guys. Uh, starting from now, we have a league of uh, this room, and uh, the good news is that the league will take decisions when everyone in this room will agree, and then you leave then that's uh, funny. That's more like Charlie Chaplin uh, movies because nothing will happen. Okay, so it was exactly the same. So this is a point where you can actually exploit this information. The unanimous vote um, didn't work in here. And you can say that um, uh, the league um, was more likely to work if the league would have been like, I don't know, take a decision um, based on a large majority or a majority. OK, it's a different thing. The, the reason why this didn't work, uh, you can see it in nowadays. Nowadays, you don't um, um, appoint leaders, for example, look at the, um, the leaders debate. OK, you don't appoint leaders or parties um, um, unanimously. Like you, you will have to wait until the entire population of New Zealand will agree with Jacinda or Judith Collins. No, 
you vote and whoever takes 50% plus one, that's gonna go in power. So it's the same thing in here. So normally a good efficient league would have been a league which uh, would have um, a good army to reinforce the decisions and take the decisions, the league will take the decisions um, with a majority, not unanimously. That was the last um, nail in the coffin for the League of Nations, the unanimous thing, okay? And also the right to veto and other stuff. So look at that. Um, the permanent members of the council each had a veto, which again means that uh, if one country will be uh, unhappy, they will just say, yeah, I'm unhappy, I'm out of here. And they will have to start the discussion again and again from the beginning because there is no other option. And then this meant that one permanent member could stop the council acting, even if all other members agreed. Members acted in their own interest rather than in the best interest of the league. Obviously, um, only a dreamer will think that uh, in the League of Nations, everyone, uh, um, all the people coming from the country will suddenly transform in uh, heroes and angels who will act for the benefit of the entire world. They will obviously act um, selfishly for their countries. And um, the other side, the Great Depression had political consequences. Um, now, this is a a good part you can write more, it's more juicy and fruity uh, in the Great Depression, but you'll have to decide which one is which, okay? Uh, many people lost their jobs and turned to extreme political parties which promised solutions to the economic crisis. The extreme parties like the Nazis or the fascists in uh, Italy, you can say the um, black shirts and so on, heaps of uh, um, other parties, the nationalistic parties did not believe in democracy and uh, consequently, they did not believe in the League of Nations, which promised international cooperation. So that was the search for international cooperation in security. That was the main aim of the League. Uh, they cared for themselves and ignored the authority of the League, obviously. So uh, this is such an easy uh, part. Now, uh, of course, you have to go up and discuss more and give more of these answers. <laughs> and of course, you can uh, you can go and look into uh, this uh, more um, when you revise the League of Nations for uh, for the uh, exam. So explain uh, with evaluation of which was more important. You know how to do that. We've done that a few times. Um, we've done this lately with uh, Ms. Begovic too. So I think we are good with that. <clears throat> what do you think about this, boys? So um, I will do um, uh, kind of like, oh, Queenie, you are here, Queenie. Good man. I will do a kind of, um, um, you know, uh, short um, opinion poll. So who's going to write in there what they're going to do? So what do you think you're going to get from this one? Uh, just be very... Um, I don't know, be very um, realistic. Just write in here so I can see what do you think you're going to get from this one. So you have a four for Island Islands, um, League of Nations, important agencies, uh, six, and then um, the weaknesses of the League for 10. What do you think you're going to get? I think I'm going to get... Uh, Four from the first one. Let me write in here. So I'm going to get four from the top because it's easy. Maybe five from the second one and eight from the other. Thirteen plus four, that will be 17. That's me. 17 out of 20. What do you reckon? 14, Queenie. That's okay. It's not bad. Where do you score less? Where do you think you're going to score less? <clears throat> Matthew 15, that's good, not bad. Theo 15, yeah. 10 and 6, yeah, I should say so. 4 is easy. Okay, so what we're going to do now, I'm going to do another one with you quickly, and then I'm going to let you be um, 
Um, then I have to go uh, have some work to do around the house, but I will be back with vengeance tomorrow again. So we're going to go to the next one. Um, let's see, because you have to do the second one too. So many tensions contributed towards the collapse of peace in 1939. Describe relations between Italy and Germany in the 1930s. Uh, remember 1930s, uh, that's a tricky one. It's not, it's not as easy as you think. 1930s started in 30 and ended in 39. Okay, in 40. So um, it's quite a changing story. Remember that uh, Mussolini was in the beginning in uh, the Allies um, boat and then he jumped into Hitler's boat. So remember that Mussolini initially he opposed the first attempt to Anschluss uh, made by Hitler and then he approved the second attempt and the final one, which actually produced the Anschluss. So um, Mussolini was kind of like uh, in two boats and the relationships are not amazing uh, from the beginning. OK, what do you think about that? Describe relations. OK, let's go straight to the answer. <coughs> <clears throat> oh, look at that, boys. Relations were tense in the early 1930s, but improved from 1936. What happened in 1936? What happened in 1936? They started to discuss a possible axis, isn't it? Okay, so um let's do this together look at that beautiful i love the four pointers they are so cool so i'm going back to my <clears throat> history cards and i'm gonna write here new and then i'm gonna write 005 and i will say um germany and italy Good. So, look at that. <clears throat> um, good. Uh, we're going to do this uh, each day from now on, boys, apart from weekends and apart from last Friday, next Friday, because next Friday I'm at school, I'm doing. Um, something at school so i cannot uh, be there or maybe because i don't know exactly when i have that uh, i have an interview and so i don't know exactly when is that maybe i can do it from my class and you'll be home that will be a first isn't it that would be cool anyway <clears throat> look at that beautiful Control A. I like to work on computer. Uh, 12, and this will be 14 and bold. And that's about it. Look at that, what you have to write. Any, any four of these will do the job. Uh, describe relations between Italy and Germany in the 30s. Relations were tense in the early 30s, but improved from 36. Mussolini was worried about a possible German takeover of Austria in 1934. He started to discuss from 31, and at that point, <clears throat> these people um, <clears throat> from uh, France and Britain, they said we're going to use Mussolini to actually um, kind of uh, stop Hitler and move troops to the Italian border with Austria. A meeting with Hitler followed in Venice. Uh, that went badly. Uh, in 35 Italy joined the Stressa Front against Germany. Look at that, against Germany. Okay, so first of all, was against Germany. Um, in 36, Hitler and Mussolini fought together in Spain. What was that? During what? Spanish Civil War. Spanish Civil War, very good. 
Look at that, how easy it is to do cards. It's the easiest on planet. In October 36, a possible axis was discussed. Mussolini visited Germany uh, in 37 and was impressed. 37 joined the anti comintern pact with Germany and Japan. So that was the base of the uh, later alliance. In 38, accepted the Anschluss. In 39, signed the Pact of Steel with Germany, which was the maximum alliance that uh, Italy has done uh, during the war. Stress affront was just uh, a little bit of like a, like a joke. Um, so you can see here, four of these, calculate now how many you will do. Uh, you will know for sure to say this thing, which is very important. And then uh, that Mussolini was worried about um, an Anschluss. You remember that because we talk about that. So relations were tense. That's the first thing you write. And then um, you may or may not remember the um, Hitler um, that in the book. So it's, you're supposed to study this. Um, after that, uh, Italy joined the stress affront against Germany. Stress affront should be in your uh, knowledge. Um, if not, you will remember that for sure. They fought together in Spain. Um, that's the point why we discuss here. We actually learn more. Uh, so Hitler and Mussolini fought together in Spain. Uh, October 36, a possible axis was discussed. <clears throat> then visited Germany and was impressed. You have to remember that. And then the anti comintern pact, which is huge. So you can remember this too. And then in 38, Mussolini accepted the Anschluss. He was okay with that. Remember in 34, he actually massed some troops on the Austrian border to prevent Hitler from taking over um, Anschluss and Hitler backed down. Mussolini was more stronger than Hitler at that point in 34. So look at that. Um, that's the reason why when they met in Venice, uh, things went so badly because they were really on opposite um, ideas. And then 39, uh, they signed the Pact of Steel just before starting the war. So look at that. I think my guess will be that all in the worst case scenario, you will get um, only three in the worst case scenario. But I think you can actually really do uh, four in this one because it, it, it is not an easy one. It's not the easiest uh, four pointers I ever uh, seen, but it is what it is. OK, so this is ready to let's go back to that. Where is the thing here? Good. Um, awesome. we we'll go to the next question. Why uh, was there an increase in militarism in Japan in the 30s? Oh, this is a tough one. Uh, remember, you don't have to choose here. You have to do both. Um, so why was there an increase in militarism in Japan in the 30s? Why? What would you say in this one? Didn't, didn't these feel like uh, they were mistreated by other powers, like especially Western powers, because um, they were Asian and they felt like the and due to economic hardship, they thought that the world was out to get them. Yes, excellent. And remember, remember what happened. Very good, Michael. Remember what happened in the 30s. What happened with Japan in the 30s? What was the big deal with Japan? Didn't the um, military sort of like, they didn't like overthrow the um, government, but they sort of did what they wanted or they split off? Yes. Yes, very good. And also, what did you l learn in? Um, so what I want to ask from you will be, uh, you said the perfect war queen, um, um, economic hardship and other stuff like that. Uh, how? How did they want to actually fix the problem of economic hardship? They um, wanted, they invaded Manchuria. Awesome. So they wanted to go in some other parts of the planet and get the resources. Where else then uh, 
close to them in China. So that will be uh, my guess. Let's see what they say in here. Uh, mind you, I didn't do this uh, in like years. Let's see. Oh, beautiful. So four marks for uh, one explanation, five marks for full explanation. Look at this, what you just said, boys. There were economic problems, shortage of land meant not enough food was grown. Go to the basics, go to the food, the rice, to all this stuff, okay? Japan wanted to expand to get raw materials or the magic word resources, okay? The people respected the military. You can say that back in time in Japan, it was a big, huge tradition of militarism the Bushido code and the samurais and everything. You don't have to go in so depth, but uh, people respected the military. Even nowadays, they respect the military. Uh, military policies to expand territory were popular, obviously. All the countries um, at that point, they didn't care too much about other countries and the international justice or stuff. They didn't care about that. They wanted land and food. Uh, when you are hungry, you don't care about rights and stuff. Okay. Um, and then the military gained influence in Japan politics, uh, what Queenie said, they were really uh, increasing, uh, increasing controlling the uh, politics. And then martial law was declared after the prime minister was assassinated in 32. That's a good thing to remember. And the new government in 32 was dominated by military figures. So if you know any, um, any th um, three of these, you will get three credits like that. Now, if you explain one um, good, uh, in a good way, you will get five. So look at that. You explain the one with the land. So let's see. Uh, Japan was facing economic difficulties in the early 30s. You know that. You will write that. You already said that now. And this led to an increase in militarism. So you... You actually start immediately by addressing the question. Why was there an increase in militarism in Japan? Because they had economic troubles. That's the point, okay? So Japan was facing economic difficulties in the early 30s. There was a shortage of land for farming and this led to high prices and food shortages. So explain in very few words. Japan was also overpopulated and this meant competition for housing and manufactured goods. Remember, Japan is a small archipelago and they don't have enough space. Uh, they have heaps of islands around. Everything, every inch is uh, occupied. And so that was the case at that point too. And they had a big population. So both these problems put a strain on Japan. The military wanted to expand Japan's territory to address these problems and they attempted to gain power. Their policies were popular with many Japanese people as they would help Japan to overcome its economic problems. I would, um, I would actually give an example in here uh, from Manchuria uh, gaining uh, that territory. Few bits and pieces about that, not too much. And then if you explain two reasons from here, so I will get this one, the first one, and probably I will go with um, this part in here, grouping this part in one thing. And I'm going to say that the first one, Japan was facing economic difficulties is the top one. And then the second one will be that um, um, military people, soldiers, uh, generals, uh, military policies were very popular. So I'm, I'm, I will go into this part in here and create another uh, good reason uh, to explain it. And then again, only if you actually put this together and uh, just link them with some uh, nice sentences, that's going to give you six uh, unfanfare, which means easy six. Okay, you got it, boys? Good. Now, look at the last question, which is absolutely beautiful. How far was Hitler's determination to defeat communism to blame for the Second World War in Europe? Now, this is a very difficult question 
because of the way the question is uh, written. How far was Hitler's determination to defeat communism to blame for the Second World War? So how far was uh, Hitler's um, kind of um, um, hate of communism, how far was this uh, one, uh, one of the reasons for the Second World War in Europe? What would you say in this one? Give me something. Uh, pretty significant as a lot of Nazi propaganda was oriented around this Judeo Bolshevist. Um, yes, myth. excellent, excellent, excellent. So the answer immediately, and then you go directly to something they've done, which is um, propaganda. Uh, Nazi regime was good in few uh, specific aspects. One was propaganda. A good in, in terms of uh, using this in a very uh, good way for them. So propaganda was actually the Nazi propaganda was um, it studied even nowadays in universities as one of the most perfect examples of how to use uh, propaganda to achieve uh, your target. So Nazis were experts in uh, making you believe that uh, they are right and you are wrong and stuff like that. Excellent. So we go. Uh, to this and see what they say. Um, good, so we go uh, on to into this part. Uh, one side, let's see. <coughs> Hitler hated the communists and made it clear, uh, clear that the Soviet Union was his enemy. He believed that the Bolsheviks wanted to take over Germany. Therefore, he was determined to defeat the USSR. So what other perfect um, a target he will find uh, other than USSR, none. USSR was the best target, even, even in explaining let, later one of uh, another beloved policy, um, uh, the Lebensraum, okay? Where to expand in the vast Russian territories. We're gonna get that and we're gonna annihilate uh, the Russians. That was his um, idea. He signed the Nazi-Soviet pact with Russia but he always intended to fight Russia when he had conquered the West. And Stalin knew that. Everyone knew that. So it was such a crazy, interesting piece of, um, uh, of a treaty signed ever on this planet uh, uh, between two arch enemies, two rivals. Uh, they knew that they're going to, uh, you know, kind of fight um, against each other. Uh, and despite that, they signed this uh, Nazi Soviet pact, which was a blow for the entire planet. It was like such a crazy thing to do. When Hitler invaded Poland, as agreed in the pact, the Allies declared war, and this led directly to the Second World War. So again, you go back to the question. Key words in there, Hitler hated the communists, and you have them in the question too. And then... Um, and then Hitler invaded Poland as a leader pact, the Allies declared war, and this led directly to the Second World War, the blame for the Second World War in the title. Um, of course, another factors, let's see, uh, were also responsible. Hitler wanted to destroy the Treaty of Versailles and the fact that Britain and France did not stop Hitler from remilitarizing the Rhineland encourage him to build up his forces beyond the Versailles limit and to start demanding more territory such as, I won't uh, stop to talk only about Austria, I would say, uh, Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia and Austria. An each step taken by Hitler without preventative action by Britain and France, which will be what? This will be... Um, the appeasement policy. Exactly. The appeasement policy of uh, Chamberlain gave him confidence that they would not intervene over Czechoslovakia and Poland. Look at this, how easy it is to put it in this way. And then uh, evaluate how far and um, 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 L4 answer will have minimum of three explanation, two on one side, one on the other. So we, will, we are looking for um, three and two, and that's about it. So boys, we're gonna look only on the questions. And we're going to do this tomorrow. Um, good. 
please don't do this. Please don't do this. OK, please leave that apart. Um, don't tell me about why was the convoy system introduced. I'm not interested in that. Um, so let's see. We go to depth study. Good. From this, we have to choose. Um, we have to choose what? Both or one? One. One, exactly. Don't have any doubts, please. <laughs> it's enough for two hours. <laughs> okay, so which one would you choose? Come on, tell me. You'll choose the first one. The Weimar Republic faced many problems. What were the November criminals? Man, this is so easy. Why yeah, was yeah. there okay, the first left, left first wing one. opposition to the German Republic? The Weimar Constitution doomed the Republic to failure. How far do you agree with this statement? That's not easy. Uh, you will be lured into this one because uh, November criminals and maybe left wing opposition, which was interesting. But the last one is not easy. Let's see the second one. The economy changed a great deal under the Nazis. Describe the four-year plan. Easy. Why were some some people unhappy with the changes the Nazis made to the economy in the 30s? Interesting. Very good. The Second World War brought little change to Nazi economy. How far do you agree to this statement? Ooh, that's a difficult one. I don't even know what I will choose in here. Probably, probably I will go for the second one. <coughs> Or or the first one. It's it's really up to you. What do you think? What will you choose? Okay, I will ask you one by one. Let's see. Um, okay, let's see who do I have in here. Uh, ben, what will you choose in here? Eleven or twelve? Um, eleven. Eleven. Yeah. OK, um, Matthew. 12. 12, interesting. Michael? 11. Good, Queenie? 12. 12. Let's see what Theo will decide. Theo? 11. OK, so majority four. Uh, 11. OK, uh, we're going to do this tomorrow. Uh, we'll see you at the same time. Um, and um, just let me stop recording and then uh, you are free to go, boys.